Welcome to ADA Summit. My name is Martin Zakowski. I'm a senior solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. When as a solutions architect, I work with large retail enterprises in Germany and I help them with their cloud journey. And besides that, I'm, I'm a serverless specialist. So I'm super interested in event-driven architectures. Well, and today I want to show you how we can combine this, how we can innovate retail with event-driven architectures. And the first question here might be, why is that important for a modern e-commerce company? And then maybe how can we move to an event-driven and serverless architecture? Um, first, we need to understand the nature of, of the e-commerce business. And I can tell you something, nearly everything in e-commerce can be considered an event. Let me give you an example. Um, when I go to my favorite online shop, when I press the buy button in that online shop, I create an event. So the event might be user Martin has bought a coffee machine. Um, he bought model XYZ. He paid 500 euros for that. And based on that event, some services in the background will handle the payment. They will create an invoice for me. They will send a confirmation, get the item, package the item, and then finally put it on a truck. And later they will send me a notification that the item has left the warehouse and so on and so on. And it will also update the inventory, maybe reorder the item, update the search, update the recommendation algorithm, and so on and so on. So basically running an e-commerce platform means processing events at scale. So the next question is, um, if one event will cause all these actions in e-commerce, um, how can I use that nature of the business and build a corresponding architecture? How can I build an event-driven architecture. And what do we actually mean if we're talking about an event-driven architecture? An event-driven architecture uses those events to trigger and to communicate between decoupled services. And to be honest, it's a common architecture pattern in modern applications that are built with microservices. So before we dive into these architecture patterns, we first need to understand the core element of an event-driven architecture, and that is the event itself. So what is an event? Uh, event is a thing that happens. And of course, something that might be of importance for the system. So an event can be maybe a change in state or it can be an update. As in my example, um, it is a coffee machine that has been bought by me. And events are immutable. That means they cannot be changed. They cannot be deleted. And they are ordered in the sequential order of the occurrence. And events can contain completely different level of information. So events can either carry the full state. Um, for instance, the, the user Martin bought the coffee machine, model X, Y, that for 500 euros. Um, and it has to be sent to Martin's apartment in Hamburg. Or an event um, can be an identifier only. Um, so your coffee machine has been shipped and that's it. Um, well, there's something important to know about events. Events are not commands. So commands are something that is directed towards a recipient. Um, for instance, like, um, can you please create an invoice for this coffee machine? And then there's someone saying, um, okay, well, I will do this. Um, creates an invoice and here it is. And then it returns the invoice. This is different for events. So events can be observed by consumers. And these consumers then know what to do with that event. So the event would be customer Martin ordered a coffee machine. And then someone knows, well, whenever we like sell something, well, an invoice has to be created and to be sent. And then someone else knows like, ah, oh, when we sell something, a sales report has to be updated with that revenue. And the cool thing is the event producers don't need to have any knowledge about who is listening to their events. And other consumers can be added without any changes to the event producer because they don't know of each other. And that keeps the producer and the consumer very simple because they don't know each other. Um, there's something else about events that we need to know. Events are asynchronous by nature. So for a command, I have to wait for a response. So if I'm sending a command to service, can you please create an invoice for the coffee machine. And then the service has to do something, maybe has to get additional information from another service or so on. Um, and I have to wait all the time for this to happen. And then I get the final response, the invoice. 
And we call this a, a synchronous call. And this is completely different for, for events. So events are asynchronous. It's like fire and forget. So the service that observes the event will process the event and eventually report back. So the event would be Martin has bought the coffee machine and someone will say, okay, I got it. I, I will create the invoice, wait for it. And then somewhere later saying, who? Yeah, I got an invoice for you. I will send the invoice. So that's an asynchronous um, call. Well, now that we understand the characteristics of these events, let's see how we can use that, how we can build architectures with that. And um, here I have a typical, well, to be honest, very simplified uh, event-driven architecture. Um, so we usually have three key components. We have event producers, we have event routers, and event consumers. Let's start with the producers. So um, what are producers doing? Of course, they're they are creating the event because something has happened, something has changed. For instance, the user has bought something or um, an item is ready for shipment or so on. And then the producer publishes that event to the router. And the event router receives the event, stores it for the time being. Maybe it can also filter the uh, events and um, it will push the event to the appropriate consumers. And consumers, they receive and process the event. For example, they do something with that. They create an invoice, or maybe they start the shipment process and so on. As we can see, um, producers and consumers, they're completely decoupled. And that allows them to be scaled independently, to be updated independently, and also to be deployed independently. And that brings us to some of the benefits of this event-driven paradigm. Well, by decoupling our services, they are only aware of that event router in the middle. They don't know of each other. And this means that your services can work together, but if one service has a failure, well, the other services will keep running. For example, um, if your shipment notification fails, well, you can still create an invoice. You can still package something. You can still ship the coffee machine. Only the shipment notification is not there. So you can scale and fail your services independently. And another thing, um, you no longer need to write custom code to, to get messages, to filter messages, and to route messages, because you got this event router that will automatically filter and push events to the right consumers. So there is no heavy coordination between the producer and the consumer required. Well, and this is, if you've done this, this is speeding up your development process, so you can develop with agility. And since the event router acts as this centralized location, um, you can easily audit your entire application. You can define policies so you can check and you can control who has access to which events to like what is going on in your system. So who can see that someone ordered a coffee machine? Who can see the payment details? Who can see the shipment address? Well, event-driven paradigm helps you to easily audit that because you're exactly in the middle and you can see everything. Well, and event-driven architectures are usually push-based. So everything happens on demand as the event presents itself to the router. So you do, don't pay for, for continuously checking for, for something new that happens like, hey, hey, is the coffee machine ready for shipment? And then a second later, what about now? Is it now ready for shipment? And now? And now? Well, you don't have to do this. And if you don't do this, uh, it results in less resource consumption because you don't have to pull constantly and ask if something has changed. And this will definitely help you to cut costs. So as you can see, there are definitely a lot of benefits uh, of using event-driven um, architectures. But as always, all the benefits, they also come with some challenges. And here I want to bring a, a, a quote um, um, that has to do that building event-driven architectures is actually a paradigm shift. So um, the architecture of your product can be completely different compared to like everything that you've done before with command-based, API-based, or service-oriented architecture. So you cannot simply um, replace commands in your architecture by events and keep everything else as it is. Um, Greg Young once said, when you start modeling events, it forces you to think about the behavior of the system as opposed to thinking about the structure of the system. So it might require using a completely different approach to design and to architecture this new system or your new product, or maybe to, to re-architecture and to rebuild an existing product. But this can be a, a quite a, a journey to, to achieve that. So 
event-driven, to be honest, is not always the right answer for every single problem and for every single use case. But I can tell you from experience, it can make things significantly easier. So if you feel that event-driven is something for you and might help you in your use case, what are the things you should consider when starting this journey to, to event-driven architectures? And, and here again, to be honest, there is no one-size-fits-all blueprint for event-driven architectures. This, this wouldn't be true, this wouldn't work. It's just a different paradigm. Um, and that's why we see multiple patterns and they all have a, a, a purpose, like event notifications or event carried state transfer, event sourcing, CQRS, and many, many more. Um, they're all there for a good reason. And in order to choose the right pattern for your solution, well, you need to understand the characteristics of the events in, in your system, how your system behaves, like the nature of your business, um, and then the processing requirements in your system, how everything works together. And you have to consider various facets of event-driven. Um, and as always with architecture, you have to make some trade-offs to find the most suitable approach for your problem. And we don't want to go into detail on that topic because it's, it's a bit technical, but let's just briefly talk about some important facets and trade-offs trade um, that will shape your event-driven solution and uh, also define your architecture. And here we need to talk, talk about event ordering. Well, you have to ask yourself, do I really need strict ordering of my events? Like, do I strictly have to preserve the order in which the events occurred? Or am I maybe fine with best effort ordering? For example, like let's imagine my friend ordered the same coffee machine five minutes before me. Is it really required to ship his package before mine package? Do I have to ship it five minutes before? Um, but sometimes strict ordering could be desired. Sometimes it's even hard required. But to be honest, it always adds complexity and it has a price tag. And usually it has lower performance or item potency. So in, in really rare cases, it can happen that the same event will be resent. And item potency means that processing the exact same event repeatedly must have the same result as processing the event once. So let's take the example with the coffee machine. Um, if the event is sent twice, well, the question is here, do they charge me twice? Or does that payment service already know that I have been charged for one coffee machine? And, and if your payment service can handle this, and I only pay for one coffee machine because I only ordered one and the event has been sent twice. Um, will the fulfillment send me two coffee machines? Well, I would like to have uh, two coffee machines, but uh, might be bad for your business. Um, and, and if my services are not item potent, if they cannot um, detect duplicate events, well, I have to add some more intelligence to my event router in the middle. I have to enforce exactly once delivery of my events. And doing this, comes with a price tag. It comes with additional complexity in your entire system, but also with additional complexity for all the events that are sent correctly. So you need to understand if your services are item potent. And maybe you ask yourself, like, is the event targeted for only one recipient or for many recipients? For example, like the event that we just discussed, um, Martin purchased a coffee machine. Well, this might be relevant for, for many services like payment, invoicing, shipment, and so on. But the event, um, your coffee machine will arrive tomorrow. That is only relevant for one recipient, only for me. So you have to ask yourself, do I send events point to point or do I have to fan out to, to multiple consumers? And for all those trade-offs, the answer always is, well, it depends. Um, and in that journey to event of architectures, you will come across a few typical patterns um, that you should know, understand, and apply correctly. Um, so you would see event stores. We often call them queues. So events will be sent to a queue and then stored in that queue until they're processed and then deleted. The good thing is you cannot lose events because they will only be deleted once the consumer will pull for a new event. And that means the consumer will control the processing speed. So you don't lose any events when that, that consumer is too busy processing events because it got like many, many previous events. So a queue is a really lightweight buffer 
and it helps you to decouple your application. Then you will see PubSub, Publisher Subscriber. We often call this a topic. So in a PubSub model, um, an event is published to a topic and then immediately, that means without storing it in between, push to all the subscribers, that, that's like all the um, consumers. So you can see this as a kind of a broadcast or a fan out. And all the consumers that subscribe to the topic will receive every single message that is broadcast unless you apply something like message filtering or so. And this is another way of decoupling. But the interesting part here is um, the consumer needs to be able to receive and then also to process the event at the moment it is pushed. You also see a different um, pattern that's called event router or a bus. So um, here, um, producers send events to a router or to that bus. And then the router stores, filters, and directs the events um, to appropriate downstream consumers. And consumers only get events they really care about. Well, in order to do that, we obviously need some, some logic in the middle to understand like how to route events. But the good thing is they are still decoupled from the producer. So just another way of decoupling. And if you see like all these patterns, the good thing is you don't have to decide for one pattern for your entire application. You can combine these patterns or building blocks uh, and build even more advanced event-driven patterns, um, patterns that we just discussed before, like CQRS and so on and so on. So these patterns allow you to integrate your microservices using events. Well, of course, we need to look into our microservices itself. So we said like we want these microservices, that's why we're doing event-driven architectures, we want them to be independent, as independent as possible. And we call this loosely coupled. So we have small pieces, microservices, loosely joined. In an event-driven architecture, microservices can be very independent, well, because they only need to produce and consume events. There should never be a tight coupling in an event-driven architecture. Let's see how we did this with APIs um, before um, in the past. So there was always a saying, uh, APIs at the front door of your microservices. Um, so APIs actually helped us to decouple our microservices. Why? <laughs> because APIs are contracts. Um, you can see them as hardened contracts between two microservices. And the API is defining the communication. So we have a contract in the middle. We have a contract decoupling. Um, someone can change the microservice, the way it works inside. But as long as the contract is still the same, the API still works the same. We don't care what, what the service does internally. We can treat it as a black box because we have this contract decoupling. How can we apply this to events? There's another saying, events are the connected tissues of modern applications. So with events, we are trying to apply the same, but we want to have even more decoupling. So we decouple through a contract again. And the contract in this case is not an API. The contract is the event itself. And we also decouple through the runtime because Remember, we have this asynchronous call, the asynchronous nature of events. So we're not dependent on the consumer being available at the time the event occurs. We can process it later. And that's super nice. Um, now the question is like, how do we define the contract um, in this case? Well, we said like the contract is the front door to the microservices. Um, what should be in that contract? Maybe things like, how do I transport the event? Who's the router? Um, how can someone subscribe for this event? Um, how can I restrict access to the event? What information does that event include? And so on. And usually the transport subscription and authorization is defined in the header of the event. And then the router who gets reads this header can deal with that information. But the more interesting part is the content of the event. And here we need to define um, whether we want to have a fat event like an event that includes all possible information or a thin event, an event that only includes references or metadata. And the consumer has to get additional data to process the event. Well, in an ideal world, it would be exactly in the middle. So you would just send enough information that everyone can process everything, but without knowing about any of the consumers. Well, it's hard to, to, to know exactly what information should be in there if you don't know the consumers. So in the real world, this is slightly more difficult, to be honest. Um, so for instance, let, let's look at our example. So Martin 
um, bought this coffee machine. And um, we know the product ID, product ID X, Y, Z. And if I only include the product ID, but well, each service would need to get additional um, data about the product. Um, and if you have to ask another service, um, you would introduce a new runtime dependency. And then your service is not loosely coupled anymore. Maybe the, the finance department um, might be interested in the sales price because they have to generate an invoice. Uh, and maybe also the cost price. Um, and that might be classified data, the cost price, um, that you don't want to share with other services because that's confidential. And the fulfillment department, on the other hand, might be interested in required package sizes or dimensions. Um, but no other consumer really needs that information. So it's super important to understand how many details you put into an event. You don't want to over detail the event, but you also want to avoid too many external dependencies. And that's a very important trade off you have to make because in the end, the event, what's in the event, that is the contract between the services. So as you see, event driven is a lot about decoupling. Um, we are decoupling services by an event contract and we're decoupling the runtime as much as possible by using asynchronous calls. And this makes event driven architectures really scalable and so resilient. But there's another paradigm shift um, that, that fosters this type of decoupling. Um, and, and here I want to talk about serverless. So a short recap, what is serverless? Um, I personally would say, if you build and run applications without thinking about servers, well, of course, there are servers in the background, but you don't have to think about them and you don't have to care about them. That's way more important. So we have this very famous saying, no server is easier to manage than no server. And that is that is important for serverless. So serverless in the view of AWS has four tenets. So we have no infrastructure provisioning, no management. You don't need to worry about managing any infrastructure in a serverless world. AWS has, handles um, those tasks such as um, updating the operating system and so on. And when you don't need to manage your infrastructure, well, you can focus on your business and automatic scaling. Serverless also scales as needed, up as well as down. So if your serverless microservice is getting more requests, more, more events, it scales up. If it's getting fewer requests, it scales down. And AWS manages this scaling behavior on your behalf and pay for value. So serverless also means you're never paying for idle resources. So instead of paying for the time a server spends waiting for work, Serverless um, compute resources are available as needed, and you only pay for the time they actually work. And it's high available and secure. So in a serverless world, AWS also manages fault tolerance, high availability of the infrastructure, and so on. And AWS also manages security of the serverless resources um, by applying some same defaults um, by, by building security at the core of the service. Well, looking at all of this, um, I would say these are technical benefits of serverless. But if you think about serverless, it's actually about innovation because you get this increased agility, you get excellent performance, you get high value, and you get a complete portfolio of um, services. And this is something many people don't know. Serverless <laughs> is way more than compute. Serverless is more than function as a service. Um, they're actually serverless services at all layers of the stack. Um, people often hear about the, the compute part, Lambda functions, function as a service, where you just put in the code and then it will run the code or maybe AWS Fargate. But there are also data stores like Amazon S3, DynamoDB and so on. And there's an integration layer, you know, serverless services that offer patterns we just discussed, like event stores that you need. PubSub, event routers. Well, we have SQS, we have SNS, we have EventBridge for that. And we have services for orchestration, choreography of microservices and so on. So serverless is a full portfolio to build applications without managing and even thinking about servers. The question now is um, how does event-driven and serverless work together? And first of all, these are two independent approaches for building modern applications. So that means you can, you can build a serverless application without using event-driven architectures. You can use APIs, you can use synchronous calls and so on, and vice versa. Um, you can build event-driven architectures without using serverless technologies. You can, you can use containers, you can use virtual machines, you can even use physical machines if you want that. But, but why should you 
build event-driven architectures and use serverless technologies? Um, that is an important question. And the answer is traditional servers and also containers, they run constantly. Serverless functions do not run constantly. So a serverless function is only triggered by an event. And this, this trigger by an event, we call this invocation. So the input for a serverless function is actually an event. And on the other hand, uh, in an event-driven architecture, um, you have those small microservices that can observe and react to events. So an event-driven architecture consists of, of loosely coupled components that somehow talk through events. And with serverless, well, we get those small pieces that can be loosely joined with events. And that's why I think that serverless and event-driven work perfectly together. Because you have this event source that publishes a new event. For instance, when you get a request to, to an endpoint or you have a state change or whatever. Um, and then this event will trigger a Lambda function. You get an invocation with the event. And um, this function then includes your business logic, whatever you have to do, um, basically your innovation, your, your, your business. And this function then can store data in a serverless storage, can trigger maybe other actions, a workflow, create new events maybe if you have transformed something. And in order to, to, to make perfect use of this um, serverless event-driven um, architecture, well, you should use your, your Lambda functions only to transform something. Don't use it to transport something. Why? Um, we have purposefully built services for that, for communication, for fan out, for message handling, for data replication, for writing to data stores and so on. All those problems, they are already solved in the serverless world. Well, if you combine these paradigms, you can build neat and lean architectures in order to reinvent your business and then to drive innovation. And I think event-driven and serverless, well, they are a perfect match. Why that? Let's recap the most important points. So um, we have this asynchronous communication in order to decouple our microservices at runtime. And we get queues to buffer events. We get topics to broadcast events. And we have routers if we need intelligent distribution of events. And for all of this, you don't have to provision something. You don't have to manage secure or scale infrastructure. And cost is only driven by events. If you have no events, you have no costs. So you can easily scale your business. Then you can increase agility of your dev teams. You can build more cost-efficient solutions. You can really focus on business value. You can focus on your innovation. So event-driven architectures help you to innovate your business. So what should you do? One advice, think asynchronous, asynchronously. Think in events because that is actually the, the nature of retail and think serverlessly. Thanks for listening.